Another edition of our Litigation Psychology podcast, a video version again, welcoming Dr. George Speckard. George, how are things in Dallas? Pretty good, actually. Weather's nice this time of year. Excellent. Uh, you can see the Orlando, Florida backdrop. I actually had to put on a little uh, little uh, sweater uh, today. Got a little chilly, but I'm, all, I'm totally okay with that. I think the East Coast is going to get colder in the next couple of days. Yeah, and I know what's coming this summer, and then the hurricane. You know, between COVID, hurricanes, I mean, that's welcome to Florida. Uh, what we want to do on today's podcast was talk about the whole nuclear verdict concept. You and I have authored a paper on this. We have done a CLE webinar for DRI, and we want to get the word out and, and do more of these for law firms and corporations. So the purpose of this podcast is to kind of give our audience a little – taste of what they would get in the 90 minute uh, CLE. And you have identified pretty much five key factors uh, when it comes to nuclear verdicts. But before we get into that, can you talk a little bit about your career? The nuclear verdict issue is nothing new, correct? This is something that's, that's been around for a long time. It's right. Just- in fact, that's why we entitled the article Old Wine, New Bottles. It's a, it's a, obstacle or a challenge that's it's been around for quite a while, uh, maybe even going back to the 1984 uh, uh, Pennzoil-Texaco $10 billion verdict. Um, there are a number of huge verdicts in the late 90s, hundreds of millions of dollars for just business disputes or just a single, single death. Um, those things have been around for a while, but the nuclear verdict is just a new term. They used to call it runaway jury. Yeah. Right? They made a movie about it for crying right. out loud. Um, so let's kind of talk about these, these factors um, that you have studied for 30-something years now as really reliable predictors of nuclear verdicts. And the first one, which... To me, yeah, it's dear to my heart. Uh, problematic witnesses. Talk a little about. Take a minute to talk about how witness testimony can really lead to big, big problems in the deliberation room if it does not come across as credible and effective. And you know, because both of us work in the same industry and are confronted with the same challenges when we work with clients, I think the, the witness problem is something that's near and dear to both of our hearts because. I keep running into this, the same issues that you do. Yeah. Um, and the thing that comes to mind most readily is problematic depositions. Um, on videotape. On videotape or maybe even not. But yeah, videotape, you get all the problems with nonverbal behavior, which is a whole nother can of worms. Yeah. Um, but even, even without the videotape, uh, I had a class action race discrimination case once where it's, you know, a a high ranking executive of the company said that the N word could be a term of endearment. And that was in his deposition, you know, and what happens when you do stupid things like that um, is you're handcuffed on a freight train to hell and you can't get off, you know, because those you're you're married to those statements forever. You you know, that they're in the record and you can't get rid of them. Tell, Tell the audience about how, when you were a younger consultant at your first company, And your marketing pitch was that, you know, hey, jurors are making decisions after opening statements. And some of the research you did to find out, well, maybe that's not so true. Uh, When are these jurors really making their decisions, George? Yeah, that's one of my favorite war stories. But this is, I was young in my career. It's 1983, um, working for Litigation Sciences, uh, which is no longer around, but... um, the CEO, those the two CEOs there were from marketing uh, division of USC, and so they were very clever at marketing. And they came up with the adage that jurors make up their minds after opening statements, which went through the litigation community like a tsunami. Everybody started talking about that. Um, wow, jurors make up their minds after opening statements? Oh, my God, you know. Of course, I think the reason that was – that adage was created was so that, you know, they could sell research just based on showing opening statements and say that that what will give you the results that a real trial would give you. Yeah. Um, that another, another problem that we can talk about there in research design. 
Anyway, so I started interviewing jurors and, and conducting post-trial juror interviews. Now, those are the gold standard of validity. That's, that's how you know what jurors are really doing. You talk to them and ask them, what, did you, what happened? How did it go? You know? the, the jurors started telling me, when, in response to the question, when did you make up your mind? They started telling me we made up our minds while watching the witnesses. And I had to go back to my boss and say, hey, what are we going to do? Because we're telling clients, jurors make up their minds after opening statements. But the jurors are telling me that they made up their minds while watching the witnesses. And he said, well, just take that out of the report. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, but that, that's when really started thinking seriously about w w where is the nexus here between personal characteristics of jurors and verdict and damages dispositions. and. At, yeah. at courtroom sciences, where we are now, we created what we call a cognitive map, which is how jurors actually decide cases, irrespective of the type of case. And the first thing they do is they look at the litigants, you know, not the lawyers, but the litigants, and they say, who are these guys? You know, what are they made of? Yeah. What kind of stuff are they made of? You know, are they likable, trustworthy, honest? And they kind of sniff them like dogs. It's very primitive. A lot of it based on nonverbal behavior. And everything stems from that. Everything comes from that one initial decision. Who are these guys? So to avoid nuclear verdicts, uh, make sure your witnesses are, 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 are well-trained. Fair enough? <laughs> yeah, and not only that, I, I really, as I look at the services we offer and the things that we do, I think it's almost patently obvious that the most bang for the buck, the, the, the most value that that we create is in witness training. I think that's the, the, the best spent money that, that anyone can, can spend to, to prepare. I, I, I totally agree. And even if you have a decent set of case facts, if you have bad witnesses, uh, things are not going to end well for you. Let's go to point number two uh, in your model here. Um, egregious conduct. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, there are some really key examples here of where, you know, if a company does something really bad uh, and, and that's presented to the jurors, uh, it's going to create a lot of anger, correct? Yeah. You know, another term that, that litigators use for that construct is bad paper. You know, you've, you've you know, emails um, or, or it can just be things that people do. You know, there are whole companies that are set up just to train corporations for avoiding these kinds of mistakes, you know, but for example, we had a, a, a case where a box car broke loose and rolled down the track and crushed this guy to death and an official for the company went over to the widow's house on the same day and said to her, we'd be willing to pay for the funeral if it's not too expensive, you know, just, Stupid oh. things that people do, you know, that jurors pick up on and they get angry. Yeah. And so, yeah, corporate conduct <clears throat> has always been an issue, but I can see that leading to a uh, nuclear verdict. Uh, number three, the whole concept of punitive jurors. And you came up, I, I believe you came up with this term, the, the stealth juror. Talk about how, um, particularly through voir dire and jury selection, how you can you can have um, punitive jurors slip through the cracks and, and create chaos in the deliberation room. Yeah, this is where you can't cannot avoid talking about science because the entire jury selection process is an exercise in prediction of behavior, and prediction of behavior is the highest level of scientific achievement. You know, if you remember from your high school classes, Newton sitting under the apple tree, you've got observation, hypothesis, theory. And then from theory, you go to prediction, and that's where you test your theory to see if it, if it holds. Um, a lot of the times, most of the time in jury selection, we see juror questionnaires that are just slapped together with items that quote unquote look good, but they haven't been tested or vetted for scientific uh, validity in terms of their ability to predict um, verdict orientation. Um, we wrote an article called uh, To Catch a Stealth juror um, is um, use science. It's from 1996, National Law Journal. And um, the way to do it is to look at discrepancies between verbal behavior in oral voir dire and written behavior in the juror questionnaire 
and see where people are kind of fudging a little bit and then yeah. probe those areas. That's but uh, it's a big problem, uh, particularly with high-level uh, conspicuous um, corporations or, or high-level conduct that makes it to media coverage. Yeah, I was working on a case where I was preparing a key witness, and I said, hey, um, do, do you need my help with you know, consultation for, during jury selection? And I kid you not, George, this attorney looked right at me and goes, hey, I bring my, my wife sits in the front row. She can read anybody and, and she's my, she's my jury consultant on how to pick the jury. Um, I kid you not. This is a true story. Um, can you talk about some of the things you've seen with, uh, particularly defense attorneys using hunches, crystal balls, uh, horoscopes, whatever, uh, in the jury selection process that's so unscientific that maybe they're very comfortable with because that's the way they've always done it. Let me tell you the thing that drives me crazy. I'm in jury selection and working with the trial team, right? And the lawyers are saying, after voir dire, you know, after we've observed the jurors, then they'll say, I like that guy. That's great that you like him, you know, but how's he going to vote? And a lot of the most plaintiff-oriented jurors are what we call amiables. They're very sociable. They're very sweet people, you know, but they operate from their gut and their feelings. And you, you may want them around for a drink, but you don't want them on your jury. That's a really good point. Uh, point number four, judicial hell holes. Now, we've talked a lot about on these podcasts and some articles about COVID-19, and we're going to do a separate podcast on that following this, uh, George. But... Um, you know, the trucking industry is getting some really positive PR, the healthcare industry, and a lot. I think a lot of people are assuming, hey, that's going to carry over into trials. And maybe the trucking industry and the healthcare industry uh, may benefit. But I think with some of these judicial hell holes, and I'd, I'd love you to rattle them off, I, I'm not sure if anything is going to change jury decision making in Philadelphia, Memphis? I mean, what are your thoughts on judicial hell holes and are they going to continue to be hell holes uh, post COVID-19? Yeah. Um, basically to cover the COVID-19 issue, just in a nutshell, um, I have very good reason to believe that things will get worse in terms of punitive dispositions, in terms of nuclear verdicts, uh, and we'll go into details to why that is. Obviously, you can't have a scientific design to test this because you'd have to have the same case before and after COVID-19 and compare the damages. So it's always going to be somebody's opinion, but uh, we could certainly discuss the reasons for those opinions. But judicial hellholes, you know, it was originally brought up by the American Tort Reform Association uh, back around 2000 or so, 2001. And this, again, shows you how long this, pr this problem of nuclear verdicts has been around. But there are different kinds of judicial hell holes, and it refers not only to the jurors, but to the, the bench as well, because according yeah. to the Tor uh, American Tort Reform Association, a lot of these venues are, have these judges who kind of grease the skids on, on this, these high damage verdicts and are really conducive to the plaintiff's uh, cause, really helpful to the plaintiff's cause. But... There are different kinds, like you've got the Rio Grande Valley down in southern Texas, where people are all sweet and nice, um, and they just give you what you ask for. And that's, you know, they don't even listen to the defense. They just want to know how much do you want. Yeah. Well, you go up to Philadelphia and Baltimore, and it's like walking into a hornet's nest. <laughs> so, you know, it's a completely different um, dynamic, but the same result. Yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. So you got to watch out where you're where your venue is. And finally, um, you know, point number five, which this is the controversial one. And I, I tend to think we get in trouble when we bring this up. Um, but Bob Tyson in his book just brought it up uh, on my podcast yesterday. And he, he has a, a whole chapter, I think, in his book, uh, his nuclear verdict book, is just the whole notion that the plaintiff's bar is really just outworking the defense bar, they're getting out, out hustling, out innovating. Uh, we, we wrote an article on this called Streetwise Litigation. 
in Litigation Magazine. It's in summer of 2003 issue, and then it was included in one as one of the best articles of the year in the ABA anthology. Um, where we got in trouble was with the judges. Really? They don't like us telling lawyers things like, you know, the line can only be find, found by crossing it, you know? Yeah. Or unless I'm told it's against the rules, it's not against the rules. Um, but l- let me just give you an example of how this works. I was in a trial in Baltimore once, and the plaintiff attorneys were taking videotapes of witnesses from that same trial and using those videotapes to impeach other witnesses. And I asked our trial team, hey, where are they getting these videotapes? And maybe we should do this too. And they said, I don't know how they're getting those tapes. I don't know where they're doing this, how they're doing this. How did we get out hustled like that? You know, or it, there's just the, the, the war stories are endless. The, the crazy weird things that, that uh, plaintiff attorneys do to capture the hearts and minds of jurors is just mind blowing. And uh, we could do a whole podcast on this. And, and, and yeah, and particularly with the um, reptile tactics being used um, and what they're getting away with in a certain vein, particularly in you know, California, which you're originally from, uh, and you've done a lot of, uh, of work out there. Um, I've seen crazy, crazy things, particularly um, at, you know, asking for $150 million in the second sentence of your opening statement. I mean, that was just unheard of at a time and now this is this is happening all over because it's working and they can they can get away with it can you talk to us a little bit about how you've seen the plaintiff's bar handle the whole topic of damages very because the defense bar does not want to talk about damages they're all trained hey you don't talk about money till the end but they're talking about it in four days yeah and, and what they're doing is exploiting an inherent conservatism that they see in the yeah. defense bar because the defense attorneys um, seem f- for some reason to be just more conservative and, and more um, reluctant to use extreme tactics. Um, it could be they're trying to protect a client relationship. You know, p- plaintiffs don't have to protect a client relationship. Yeah. Um, there's all kinds of issues that, that can encumber defense lawyers that plaintiff attorneys just don't need to worry about. Well, George, thank you so much for being on this podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to contact us at Courtroom Sciences and George and I will get on Zoom or WebEx and uh, do our nuclear verdict CLE, uh, roughly 90 minutes uh, of really great information on how to protect yourselves, uh, we'd be happy to do that. George, thank you very much. Thank you. Talk to you.